Good evening, I'm Mahi Johnny in Colombo. This is a special presentation on Sri Lanka's current economic woes where it has now hampered every aspect of our life. Sadly, the nightmare continues. Right now, we don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. It looks like the government has left all of us, its citizens, in the dark, literary and figuratively. Apparently, the action by the government seems to be tone deaf. Nobody wants to listen to the woes and cries of the people. Nobody seems to be bothered to explain the action they are going or currently taking to solve this issue. The president is clearly missing in the public eye. Sometimes we wonder, since he does not have any power cuts in his office or at his home, or because his vehicle is always fueled up and ready to go, and uh, whenever he goes uh, to eat or have consumed food, he gets it any time he wants, whether he is wondering what the heck all these people are complaining about and what the commotion is all about. As I've said many times, the government's <coughs> PR game is abysmal and absolutely pathetic. It's not the people-centric communication which the president promised. The president, along with the government, can very well learn a thing or two from the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi in how to handle uh, the PR game during a crisis. For an example, when COVID was rampant in India very recently, he continuously hammered the message of successful vaccination and showed that India is on a recovery path. Never did he say all problems were sort, sorted, but he made sure the world and his nation and everyone knows and sees as to what he's doing in real time. The presidential media department has to get their basics right. Even forgetting to put the president on standby before addressing a BIMSTEC summit shows how clueless this unit really is. However, we are still trying to get some response from the government in order to get an explanation of what's going on for that. Tonight I'm joined by the Minister of Urban Development, Dr. Nalaka Gudaheva, and uh, mind you, Dr. Gudaheva is not been, has not been assigned the economic nor financial portfolios of the government. He is the Minister of Urban Development. Now, the reason he's sitting next to me tonight is not because of anything else. It's because we hardly can get anybody from the government to come and have a discussion with us. So at least he has been kind enough to come here and explain what the current crisis is. Uh, good evening. Good uh, evening, Doctor. Uh, welcome um, to the program. But it uh, doesn't seem like it's a happy occasion to any Sri Lankan at this moment. Uh, uh, we're going through a massive crisis. We don't understand what we are going through in, in the first place. Nobody's bothered to explain it to us. Uh, the media is doing their part, uh, uh, pretty much again um, trying to explain something they don't understand. Uh, lots of nefarious agendas are also at play at the moment. Is the government tone deaf? Uh, do, isn't the government uh, not, not hearing what the people are screaming on a day-to-day -day basis? Is, is because what I'm puzzled, the SLPP, if you take uh, President Mahindra Rajpaksa, if you take President Gotabi Rajpaksa, if you take the whole SLPP, the SLFP, they were known as people who knows the pulse of the people. What's going on? Why don't you all feel what's happening is it because you all think, you know, everything is fine? Thank you, Johnny, for uh, inviting for the program. Uh, I do think they should know, at least most of them should know. Take me, for example, I, I climbed down six stories today to come for your program. In the morning, my driver was going all over looking for diesel. Couple of days time, my house will also have a problem of running out of gas if you don't find. So the problems are common, I think, except very few in this country, all others are feeling the pulse. So obviously government also should knows this. President in fact mentioned that in his speech that he's aware of that. The question is whether uh, the people who are managing the economy have figured out what's the quick fix for this. Actually there's no quick fix for this, but there's, there, there are solutions. Some are short term, some are long term. And uh, I think that is not been discussed effectively. And also how we arrived here, how the situation was created, is not explained properly. Discussed, not, not discussed effectively, is it not discussed within the government or with the people? Both, I think. Both, I think. With the people, definitely not. That is why this confusion is. I see uh, very few uh, programs 
where this problem is discussed in detail. Even if you look at the parliament, it is more or less attacking each other, not rationally discussing this. You know, you're not allowed to even speak properly on, on this subject. Somebody asks a question, raises what they call uh, uh, interruption, and no proper discussion is taking place. Uh, within the government also, uh, I don't know to what extent this is discussed at the cabinet level, because at the end of the day, uh, not a cabinet I'm not a cabinet member, so I can't comment on that, but I believe uh, we, are like a, we are in a situation like a war. Right? Yeah. When you're in a situation like a war, you have to meet regularly, almost on a daily basis. You must have a war room to discuss that. And even the cabinet must be doing that. So I don't know whether that is happening to that extent. How did we get here? Because we know this is not something that happened in the past two months. This has been a culmination of erroneous policies for 73 years since the Suddhas left. Here we are trying to figure out our economy. 73 years is a young, young, young country to be a republic, a socialist republic, a democratic uh, um, socialist republic. Uh, but we are at a tail end of a massive crisis. Before we talk about the solutions, we need to know how we got here because there is no point if the solutions are going to repeat the same errors that was made during all these 73 years because the ones who were responsible, some are in parliament still, but most, are, most do not know what they went through in the 70s, 80s, 90s. And here we are looking for solution, but even though it looks like the best solution at this moment, we have repeated it in the past and have not got us where we need to go. So how did we come here? That's a good question, uh, Mahesh. Give me a little time to explain this. See, I, I don't think we should be talking about 73 years. I mean, that has become a habit. We blame 73 years of past. Uh, because we must remember that of that 73 years, almost 30 years, we were fighting a war. We changed a lot of situations. So let's talk about the last 12 years, right? After the end of the war, right? Because if there were problems, that's the time that we had to correct the course and find solutions. So if you look at what happened uh, uh, since 2009, we have had three governments now. 2009 until 2014, we had the UPFA government. Then 2015 until 2019, we had the Yahapalna government. And now for more than two years, we had the current government. So all these three governments had the opportunity to resolve this problem. So if we are still struggling with that and if the, the situation has got aggravated to this level, all three governments have to take responsibility because this is definitely not something which was created within the last two years, even though some people like to think that way. Let's look at what happened after 2009. 2009, since the war ended, the government got involved in a rapid economic infrastructure development program. A lot of money went into infrastructure development. Uh, so government was borrowing short term as well as long term. Lo there were a lot of projects that were using that started using long term loans, which perfectly okay. But at, at the same time, government also had to settle a lot of debts. 2019-2014 period, not many people know, something like 12 billion US dollars worth of debt had to be settled by that government also. Right? We are now say, t talking as if we are settling debts of that government. It's not so. Even UPFA government had to settle 12 billion worth of debts at that time. So to meet these debt requirements and also for their infrastructure development programs, they started borrowing short-term loans, what you call ISB, International Sovereign Bonds. They borrowed about 5 billion US dollars during that period. And they also paid back some of the loans. Then came the, the next government. The next government came complaining that the previous government has got us into a debt trap. So if that is the case, they should have got us out of the debt trap. But they also didn't do that. They continued to borrow. They, they borrowed short-term loans, ISBs, 12.5 uh, billion. The previous government bought 5 billion, last government bought 12.5 billion. Then they, are, then they argue and say, no, we had to borrow to settle the previous government's debt, which is not correct, because they had to settle only 2 billion of the UPFA government debts during that five-year period. So out of the 12 billion, 2 billion was used for that, 10 billion for other purposes. Then, then of course, they also had to settle long-term debts. They settled something like 9 billion. Then previous government also settled 12 billion, so there's no excuse. Both government had to settle debts. The, the, when we when it came to 2019 in, our debt to GDP had gone up to about 
Now it is about 108%, yeah. right? And we were in a situation that every year we were to pay something like 5 billion to 6 billion US dollars of the debts. Now the question is, is debt a bad thing? Is it, are we unusual saying that we have to settle it? I don't think so. I think many people who are listening to this program must understand it is not the case. Every government borrows. Let's, right? uh, I mean, for people to understand, let's think about uh, a family structure. If we are in, in, in a situation where we are tied, we obviously go and borrow something, you know, uh, we, we in, in colloquial terms, we call it roller gahano. And, exactly. and, and uh, that's what we do. So every government, not just Sri Lanka, the whole world does mm -hmm. that same uh, theory. Actually, if you, if you listen to American politicians, during, particularly during the presidential election, every party is talking about debt trap talking about what the previous government borrowed and complained but when they come to come to power they borrow because if you want to uh, uh, bridge the balance of payment deficit in any country you have to borrow you know you have no other way but you should be able to settle that debt just like you mentioned even in our families when we borrow money to build our houses when we borrow money to buy a car when we borrow money to do build our business we should be in a position to settle that debt that is where Mahesh we went wrong we did not develop our capabilities to settle the debts. UPFA government didn't do that. Yahapalna government didn't do that. Even the current government is struggling to do that. Uh, what are the ways of settling the debts? One, you have to increase your exports. That didn't happen. We are at the range of 10 billion a year exports now for almost a decade. Right? Then foreign investments are not coming. The maximum we got for the last 10 years or so is this 12 year period was, I think 2018 we just got, got over 2 billion. There again we had the Hambantota sale, so you, it's, it's not something that you can be proud of. So we haven't developed our ability to settle the debts. That's why we are in this crisis today. So when there's a balance of payment crisis, when you get into a situation that nobody is lending you money because you are considered a bad uh, debtor to borrow, and you have to use your reserves. And we didn't have enough reserves. In 2019, when the current government came to power, our reserves were down to, I said down to, it was even below what we had in 2018, down to 7.6 billion US dollars, billion US dollars. So that had to be utilized to settle the debts. Now we don't have money. Uh, in order to uh, understand this little thing that is happening uh, on a daily basis, uh, uh, make us understand this, uh, uh, doctor. Um, fuel shipments are coming from various parts of the world. They are not entering Sri Lankan territorial waters, they're sitting outside. There are two at the moment. We are saying we do not have dollars to pay. Um, on the other side, we hear uh, they're saying somewhere around $57 million, um, there's a figure. But then you, we also say we have 2.5 billion in our reserves. See, uh, <coughs> I think um, when, you, uh, when you talk of a government, you must understand government has to handle so many different issues at the same time. Sometimes I pity <laughs> those people who are handling it right now. Of course, they also, they are also responsible for not uh, foreseeing the situation and getting us into this crisis. But if you look at the current situation, uh, we have an immediate problem of this fuel problem. We need money to borrow. But I, I assume central bank or must, central bank must also be must be thinking about the the loans that you have to settle in a couple of months time. We have to uh, we have to keep something like ten uh, one billion US dollars. So settle the uh, sovereign bonds that you have to settle in uh, two three two months time. Somebody can a person who doesn't understand economics can say forget about. Settlement of loans. Yeah, restructure. Right? This is what's uh, floating. Restructure yeah. and, and look after the people's issues right now. But the problem is uh, we have to settle something like 7 billion US dollars of those debts this year. Of the 7 billion, uh, the, the government to government debts, long term debts, maybe you can negotiate and uh, postpone. But what we call international sovereign bonds or ISBs cannot be postponed. Because ISBs, international sovereign bonds, those loans were given not by governments Indi or not by, or they are given by individuals or private companies. It is like you go and borrow some money from a, from a group of private people and they want you to settle on that day. 
and they are not going to uh, allow yeah. you to postpone and they they will go to courts already some of the large companies who have who have lent money to the countries have hired some of the best international lawyers to fight in the event we are going to default and also if you default this is the most important thing if you default that's the end of it because even for the future we'll discuss that in detail you can't get out this sovereign bonds thing we will not only this government even the future governments will have to do that so if you default today you will never be able to borrow in future why if if that is the case then why people from both sides of the aisle who claims to know economics uh, e economy and uh, say that how uh, you know they are very good in advising blah 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 but apparently during their time they didn't do jack shit <laughs> but um, right now they are saying no 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 go to the IMF I, I, I will get your take on the IMF later on but but this particular thing since we uh, spoke about uh, on not settling or restructuring they say no go to the IMF they are really good at uh, negotiating these restructuring uh, so with the ISBs we can get it restructured so is that correct I don't think so I don't think you will be able to uh, uh, negotiate and restructure ISBs that easily so that means it, in June or July seven billion or dollars needs to be paid not seven billion seven billion for the whole year out of which we already settled some some are to be settled almost every month even though people don't know we pay we pay almost every month with the seven billion is paid over the years of which there are two large payments which are ISB driven one is the 500 million that was paid in January the other one is the 1 billion that has to be settled in June I don't know you'll be able, able to escape that 1 billion that 1 billion is not uh, money that we owe to any government no, that those are ISBs international sovereign bonds and and that's a uh, that you don't think if we go to the IMF the IMF will help us in order to renegotiate and you know uh, default the payment and not exactly pay it on time and get no. get the other people on the other side to agree to whatever the uh, terms default is the last thing you should think about because if you default today your future is gone nobody's going to lend you money for a very very long period of time see uh, mahesh in this game though people don't like to listen you can't escape debt you will have to continue to borrow you will have to continue to borrow and roll this like you say you said no even we in a, in a life we ro roll out government will have to roll out if that's what the previous government did they borrowed I, I told you something like 12 billion they borrowed to settle previous government's debts we will also have to do that but if it default today who is going to lend us in the future Indeed, uh, let's take a short commercial break. You're watching the special presentation on, on the current economic crisis in Sri Lanka. I'm speaking to Dr. Nalaka Gudeheva, the Minister of Urban Development, State Minister of Urban Development. Uh, unfortunately, he has no financial portfolio, despite the fact that he was part of the whole uh, uh, manifesto that was created, the economic portion. Uh, he had a lot of inputs to give, but apparently he was not taken in to run the thing, and, and I'm puzzled about that as well. I'll get his take on that, uh, but let's take a short commercial break. We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone. This is a special presentation on Sri Lanka's economic crisis. I'm here uh, with Dr. Nalaka Gudeheva trying to get you an understanding of what's going on. Uh, more or less talk about solutions. Um, one thing we were talking about borrowing and uh, um, you said, you know, you have to keep the role going on, uh, get some money from here, settle it from that side and keep that game going on. I think one of the issues this government faced was because of COVID, the, the usual money uh, making avenues dried up and we did not have a solution for that in order to fill that gap. So here we are trying to, uh, we are in a crisis. I, I really think that is one of the catalysts of this entire uh, um, situation right now. Uh, doctor, <coughs> Um, so-called liberal economist who lives in Colombo in AC rooms and who has a really good time, gets their three meals and uh, has no problem whatsoever, um, keeps telling uh, one of the things that the whole world is doing, like printing money and all those things in order to give the people to keep the economy circulation going on. Um, says, you know, this is going to create inflation, this is bad, this is not exactly the solution. But then again, you have see countries like the United States, UK, everybody is resorting to it because of uh, COVID. 
Uh, they are also facing the same crisis that we are facing. So that is a solution they are taking, but apparently it's not good for us. Uh, what's this whole um, story about money printing? How is that impacting? Is that a right thing to do? What is your view on that? No, there's a um, recent uh, theory. It's not a recent theory, but uh, recently widely discussed theory is this, what you call modern monetary theory. Uh, the, in the modern monetary theory, the, the, the argument is that the, since the government has the ability to create fiat currency or print money, government will never run out of money. So if you have a requirement, you can always print and meet that requirement. So that theory was very widely discussed uh, in the recent past and a lot of countries during the COVID period, etc. when they were printing money, the uh, politicians used this argument. Even here, even though we didn't discuss Sometimes people say we are adapting that principle. Uh, I think the issue is that you, there you are not fully understood what they are talking about. It may be valid for USA because USA is printing dollars and they are borrowing in dollars. They are paying back in dollars. Everything is dollars. So if there is a shortfall, you can print and meet that. That is the argument. But a country like Sri Lanka can't do that. But we are not printing dollars, right? So we are printing rupees. When we print rupees, we face the usual uh, mm -hmm. economic issues that uh, all old, old uh, economic theories are talking about. Let's, let's just look at what happened to Sri Lanka, this uh, money printing issue, if, you, if I may uh, explain. Uh, when the go current government came, everybody knows there was a huge tax reduction. I personally was never supportive of that kind of tax reduction. I was always supportive of some kind of tax reduction and simplification, but what happened was little far uh, more than what we all wanted. So we lost a lot of money and everybody knows that 2020 and 2021 uh, and even 2022 the government revenue has come down mm. significantly. And that is but what even the, the, the country report of the, the World Bank's, uh, the IMF says that apparently the reason the current government is in, in this crisis is because their revenue has gone down yes. and, and that is the main reason and, yeah. and what you say attributes to that. No, it's different because you, you have to admit the reality, you know, the government uh, uh, revenue came down by about 2% of GDP for, uh, in 2018 if it was let's say uh, 12% of GDP, uh, now it has come down to about 9% of GDP, so significant drop in revenue. Why is the revenue is coming down? The cost increased because we face COVID situation, right? So there were many unexpected costs and also the way government reacted, government needed a lot of money. So to bridge this gap, government couldn't borrow or government didn't borrow, couldn't borrow. Of course, then they went from abroad, they went in and printed money and somebody would say every, every country did that. I would say printing money is okay as long as that money is utilized to increase the production of goods and services. That is where the theory works. Because if you increase money supply and if the production of goods and services also increase, then it does not lead to inflation. But when the, production, the goods and services remain the same and the money supply increases, that leads to inflation. That and is uh, uh, a very basic economic theory. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and in top of that, uh, when uh, we gave handouts a lot uh, during this particular period, and I think that was also printed through, uh, I mean, the money was printed for, to uh, uh, supply that particular uh, uh, recommendation by the finance uh, ministry. Now, uh, what those people did was <laughs> they went and brought stuff, uh, goods that was important. So pretty much that money also took, uh, exactly. I mean, if you are feeding uh, the economy of New Zealand or Australia and all uh, buying all these milk powder rather than actually talking about uh, sustaining the local businesses and buying Sri Lankan. Uh, good point. Uh, let's now talk about solutions. Um, you were a pioneer um, of the vistas of prosperity where you all were behind that document. Now that document comes at a period when there was no COVID, there was no uh, issue in the country. The only thing that was there uh, at that particular moment was the erroneous policies of the Yahapalne government that led towards a lot of suppression amongst the people economically. Now this document comes as a document that is looking at reshaping Sri Lanka into a level where it should be at. Um, and the driving force will be President Gotabe Rajpaksa. You all were behind him and you all put that theory to the people. People accepted it overwhelmingly. Here we are with a COVID crisis. We don't have a handbook for that, how to manage it. 
no idea. Now what I need to know is when you were drafting that particular policy document, is, was it such a weak document that you can't even you know, fall back at a crisis like this? Were you all in a uh, bubble when you were creating this document, not foreseeing any kind of, uh, uh, you know, hardships to the economy, uh, understanding, you know, the, 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 the everything you predict might not happen, and, you know, the risk assessment. Was the, I mean, is this document such a weak thing? Because we do not see the current government acting based on the vistas of prosperity. Right now, the ones who are doubting the vistas of prosperity is His Excellency the President, uh, the Finance Minister, the Prime Minister, and the rest of the government. Was that such a weak document, uh, Doctor? I think, in my personal opinion, Vistas of Prosperity a policy document is one of the best that we have produced ever in the uh, recent past of various governments. It was very focused. It was developed not by one person. It was developed by a collect through a collective effort of so many people, which involve economists, which involve uh, the intellectuals, which involve politicians, which involve general public. So it was a collective effort. And finally, I was very much involved in putting together the final document. I was in the last three people put the document together. Even today, I believe that's the solution. The question is, did we implement that after yeah. the government came to power? But we were there. We, we, we prepared the policy document. So, But once the government was formed, implementation was taken over by a different set of people. Whether they believed in that is the question. What is the thinking behind that? I don't understand it. If you have done a good job, should you be rewarded to continue doing that good job? Because what we see, up until the point the presidential election occurs, you have a good PR team, you have a good economic team, you have a good uh, uh, crisis management team, you have a good campaign team, all these people comes. And no sooner the presidential election is won, not just by a mere margin, but uh, by with an overwhelming majority, you're, go you're, you're, you're an economist, uh, doctor, and you're doing urban development. I don't understand that particular theory because your resource and your knowledge and your, your everything what you stand for is on economic. If, if, you, if it is economic policy, if it is uh, you know financial policy, that's what your strength is. I don't understand what you're doing with pipes and fixing all <laughs> that thing in, in Gamba. I don't understand that. Uh, why, why, what was the deviation? What, what do you think happened? I also don't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> I, probably they must have found better people or no, people well? clearly they have <laughs> not found better people <laughs> because if they did we would not be in this particular situation uh, again I come back to what are the solutions that we can apply from the vistas of prosperity for this current crisis see vistas of prosperity uh, had a vision where we want to go we wanted Sri Lanka to be a developed country long-term vision and we, we told the path to go there, the strategy to go there. Even in a corporate situation or in a war situation, you may have a strategy to achieve a particular goal. But when you go by, uh, along the way, you can come across obstacles that you never anticipated, situations which are totally new. Then what do you do? You, you change your tactics. You get into certain different tactical approach, deviate from the strategy, but you have to finally get back. To the original, to the original, pa original path. I think even right now, I think this is what we need to do. We are in a crisis situation. Unanticipated or not, you can't say unanticipated also because I think when you are in the finance management, you see these numbers. Uh, you have, you should be able to project. So you can't say unanticipated, but probably the culmination of so many different issues. But now you need two things. One, firstly, you need short term solutions to get out of that which is a difficult task. Everybody will have to suffer no matter what until we get out of this crisis. We must pay, let people understand there's no quick fix. You can't go into a revolution tomorrow uh, and solve that problem. Mm -hmm. You have to find short term solutions and I think about that certain idea is already there. Then you come back to mm -hmm. the long term you solution we already proposed. Would you like to tell uh, what the solution is? Uh, no, sh short term is very clear Mahesh. What we need to do is we, what, what we have is a dollar crisis no yeah. we have a balance of payment crisis so we need short term foreign cu currency the, it cannot uh, be uh, uh, generated through export increase 
it cannot be generated through foreign investments and it cannot be generated through tourism in the short term right so short term you have to borrow or you have to readjust your debt structure that is why you have to go for restructuring your debts you have to borrow from somebody and that is where the going to imf matters because you are going to somebody who has some kind of credibility to hold your hand and with that strength you go and renegotiate you postpone uh, and find some money at least let's say uh, my estimate at least 4 billion you have to find from somewhere this but year. imf yeah. is not going to give us hope imf is not going to give but imf being with imf might help you with whom no with 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 international lenders no international lender is going to give you money now no with the current situation but, but why aren't we looking at bilateral relations because this is something i've been floating around all throughout uh, since this crisis began is because there are two superpowers in our region who can help they can pretty much get us out of this crisis mm -hmm. and they are also willing to help that that is the, the the sad part about this entire story is that they are willing to help and we are not going and asking them for that help uh, we have to bite the bullet we have to let the let our ego down and actually go there and say because uh apparently what i see is instead of going and really uh, having a, a cordial conversation and say look here we're going through and and the other argument that i have is these four nations like if you take india china singapore uae these have imported so much into this country our to top four importers those are the nations that we import that means their reserves were filled with sri lankan money so when we are going down the drain we do have a case to make so please explain uh, doctor why the imf is better solution rather than uh talking to a country like india we, i i know we've been speaking we just got 2 billion dollars of it uh, but then there is something called a credit line which we don't understand exactly how that is going to work and how that is going to increase because even with that 2 billion dollars uh, uh, ships are still uh, uh, you know in the sea not being able to pump the fuel into the country because we can't make the payments so we don't understand what exactly does this mean um so that kind of uh, crisis is right now occurring so how come <laughs> imf is the silver bullet no 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 i i if imf wouldn't have been required at all if he did what you just said on time yeah, we we had time no we could have got into that situation we should have started the discussion unfortunately it doesn't seem to be the case so we are now in a crisis so now when you're in a crisis you have to take the bitter pill you have no option that is why you have to go to imf and get their support but at the same time you have to continue that dialogue with the other uh, institutions other countries as well uh what would imf do differently than than not uh, let's say <laughs> going to china or anything because what i also trying to figure out and a lot of people out there are also trying to figure out is somebody who fails 16 times could not get our economic discipline correctly because nobody listened to them at that particular point could not get anything sorted out for 6 i mean they've been here from 1950s onwards so couldn't do that but we say that 17th time they're going to sort everything out my gosh that is that is that is the point when what we must understand understand uh, imf not not going to wave the magic wand and solve your problem imf is telling you a way to move forward and actually you don't need imf that is exactly what we were saying in our vistas of prosperity we said the same thing right if you look at the current imf report what they are proposing and what we told two years ago is more or less the same so what you need is a discipline to do the right thing some decisions are difficult for example if you say the restructuring the the, the current sois which are which are which have become a huge burden to the nation at the moment you don't need imf to do that right people have been saying that for a very 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 long period now imf is saying the same thing I think whether IMF te is telling you or not, we have to do that. Bridging the the budget deficit uh, and increasing your uh, export industry, bringing foreign investment. I don't IMF don't have to tell you. We already know that. But at least what will happen is when the government is in a crisis situation, government in a pressure, sometimes government may listen, stop doing politics, and do that. If you don't do that, IMF is not, if not going to help. even even this time if you go to imf saying no this policy what you are saying and what you are going to do is different it is not going to help 
Uh, as much as I, uh, you know, I hope that we will be able to solve our problems rather than depending on uh, you know, institutions that has not worked for us, but then again, I'm not the decision maker, I'm not uh, the leader of this country, so obviously it's, it's up to the government and, and, and the president himself. But, but what you may, uh, what the, the, the point you made uh, makes sense in order to understand, but then there is all those repercussions of it as well. Uh, the other argument is, I, I, like you said, IMS, IMF is going to create kind of a discipline, but then again, Minister, um, you said, at a time of crisis, we might take the pill, but you know that the crisis is also going to surpass, and then we forget that is what <laughs> this country has always been. So why don't we find a solution by ourselves and stick to it? Because this government is very good in, in going with homegrown solutions and sticking to it. Why is that not a conversation among uh, within the government? That's right, much. I think I think I, I think every crisis ha has an opportunity in building that. Right now, people in this country, everybody from top to bottom, is suffering, and they know there's a problem. So, what the government has to do right now, in my personal opinion, the people who are managing the economy must come and explain this to the yeah, people yeah, and course. explain to the people what went wrong in the past. Sometimes trying to please people, short term. We have done certain things which are wrong in the long term. We have to explain to people. Perhaps this time people might listen. At least sufficient majority will listen. Right? That's what I've mm -hmm. always been saying. Even in, in my intro, what I said was, uh, Minister, that uh, we just need the information and we just need our leaders are working for us. Uh, that is not, you know, sadly, I mean, if you all, I, I hope you all communicate to the leadership uh, saying that, you know, it's not the way to go. And the, I think, in my personal opinion, the PMD needs to be fired on the spot for a absolutely a pathetic job done during a crisis. Anyhow, uh, let's take a s short commercial break. I want to uh, get into the deeper conversation of how exactly IMF uh, might solve the problems with the doctor. I'm here with uh, uh, Dr. Nalika Gudeheva, uh, the State Minister of Urban Development, despite the fact that he's an economist. We'll be right back. Welcome back. This is a special presentation on Sri Lanka's current economic conditions, uh, economic woes, the nightmare sadly continues uh, in Sri Lanka. Hopefully, we'll try to fix things. Um, what uh, we need to realize is there's no point in trying to do a quick fix for the current crisis because we have to weather it. We may have to go through all this, but what we need to be diligent is we can't take decisions based on emotions. And if we take decisions based on emotions, we will be at this particular point next year, in six months, in whatever the time, because it's going to be a repet repetitive um, matter. So what we really need to do is to figure out how we are not going to repeat this in 2023, 2024, or down the line. That's what's uh, very crucial. Um, right now, I'm in conversation with uh, Dr. Nalika Gudeheva, the State Minister of Urban Development. Doctor, um, one thing we need to understand politically, economically, even militarily, is that there are two super giants in our region, China and India. There, there is no way we can go any distance uh, without these two. They are very much present in our, in our region, in our country, and there, there is a lot of conversation. And these two are friends. They are not, we are not against them. We are not fighting them. We have a close relationship with uh, India at this uh, time of crisis, and they have helped overwhelmingly. Uh, China is missing in the conversation. As a minister um, within the government, why is that? Why, are you, uh, why is this government, who was very close to China, personally, and even the government wise, and you, I know you were uh, very much uh, involved in those discussions as well. You're not omitting China. What's the, what's the reason? I don't know whether the government is omitting China. Government has been late in paying the due attention to China and seeking their support as well. Mahesh, as you very correctly said, we need both these countries. China is the biggest trading country in the world. You cannot ignore China and China has the power, financial power to help if, if they are willing to help. India is your neighbor. 
that's your closest neighbor. You can never ignore India. You have to give due respect to India. You have to maintain your relationship to India. And India's biggest concern of Indian security is something that we must never compromise. Whatever we do, we must help India to uh, ensure their security is safeguarded. So at least now, I think we have to start our discussion with China also because India discussion has already started and it seems to be some kind of fruitful discussion mm -hmm. going on. So if government can go to China also and get their support also to very great extent, part of the problem will be solved. We, 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 we seem, I mean, there is a, uh, it looks like there's an ego problem here <laughs> because nobody from the government is extending any kind of, uh, um, ha not even a helping hand, at least go and speak to the ambassador here, have, you know, renew relations. Uh, uh, we know that there were some uh, incidences which kind of dented uh, goodwill, um, the fertilizer matter, then uh, we know about, uh, you know, rejecting one of their banks, which was one of a prominent bank for them to, in order to deal and which got blacklisted because of our inaction uh, then uh, there is the fact that the, there is an active uh, invitation from the president of China to our president to visit to do a state visit which is customary which we have not done we are hiding behind this COVID excuse which is not right um, why do you think I mean like China is willing to help uh, even when we keep asking from you know internal sources of the or, or closer to the government of China, they say that you know we can't forcefully come and give you anything. Uh, you got to understand that this is a two-way stream. So why isn't that a strong voice within this government? I am not very sure, but I don't think anybody is ignoring China. Probably uh, we didn't uh, make the right effort on time. At least now we must do that. The diplomats who are handling that uh, side have to make an extra effort to rebuild our strong relationship that we had. I mean, China, after all, was, was uh, one of our best friends, right? Still. <laughs> for, for a very, very long period. And the fr that friendship has to continue. Uh, so obviously, the president has to visit China, uh, rebuild that relationship, and get there involved as much as we do with uh, India. Borrowing from a country like China, the idea of a bailout from a country like China, is that a feasible thing for Sri Lanka at this moment? See, if you look at the numbers, they are not very big numbers when you look at the size of China and their ability. Uh, whether China has gone and given that kind of bailouts to other countries, I'm not aware of, right? Uh, the way they operate is different. Uh, but there could be possibilities. There could be possibilities with China because China can become a good trading partner. Mm. So you have to start the discussion and see. Uh, on top of it, we heard from India that uh, we got around 2.5 billion, but uh, of that there was something called a credit line, which means usually if we understand uh, theoretically here, uh, is that you know there is uh, you can buy stuff uh, you know from India for a particular amount, which which could means fuel and all those things. Now that means we don't have to make dollar payments right now. So when fuel comes in, can we get them right into the country, or is that is that a problem with that as well? No, the swap arrangements will help um, in their importing from a particular country because it is using that country's money to make settlements. No. So going to for swap arrangements with countries with, with whom we have bilateral uh, trade agreements uh, will always help in the short run. So that we must do with China also uh, as much as possible. But our problem, if you look at our dollar shortage, is not going to be solved only with that. You have to find ways to bring some dollars in. How? Uh, that's why I said there, 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 there are ways and there may be ways that even we have not discussed it. Take for example now uh, foreign remittances have come down significantly. That was a huge component of our inflow. No? So we started floating rupee looking for a solution but that doesn't seem to be working very well with this India system working. So we need to somehow fix that. That, that central bank has to think of a way, discuss with the right people, find a way. Because if you can take it back to the 7 billion, which was the figure just two years earlier, that itself could be a big relief. Yeah. If we fix those things, uh, this... Uh, actually, it's going to be a redundant question to ask, so I will, I will ask something else. Um, fuel, 
was one of the catalysts for this entire crisis. The supply chain uh, interruption is the one that pretty much uh, put everything down the drain. Uh, now, when getting a credit line for fuel from India, what does that mean in terms of like, can those ships straight away come into our, our, our ports and dock and, uh, you know, uh, pump the fuel into the country? Or is, that, is, is it going to be because we heard that there's a shipment coming today. So we are hoping that this particular uh, cycle of the uh, fuel crisis would, would come into a certain, um, you know, um, halt uh, because it's clearly impacting the generation of power as well. 13 hour cuts, um, don't know tomorrow, it could be 15 hours. So that is, that is adding, I mean, the common man is getting hammered from every side. There's no relief. Uh, and then you all insulted them by giving a fi mere 5,000 rupee. It's an insult, sadly, uh, to the voters who trusted you all. But um, what does that mean? Do you think that the credit line is actually helping in terms of just getting the supply chain back online? Credit line will solve the problem only in the short term. No, I understand this credit line is enough for one or two months, maybe even not that. So you need to renegotiate continuation and not only with uh, India, even with some other countries. There's no other way out. We have to somehow find fuel because right now all the problems that you're facing is related to fuel. Minister, if you are the finance minister, hopefully, <laughs> but if you are, but what would you do right now? First of all, I'm not the finance minister. But the people who handle finance, I think, must have a better discussion with people who have the know-how. Uh, in a country, you can't think alone and find solution. If you ask me what I would do, I would say alone. My thinking alone will not be sufficient to get out of this crisis. But there are a lot of people who have good ideas. There are a lot of people uh, who can, who may have half good ideas. So you have to have that discussion collectively. Use a think tank, get those ideas. Pick the best ones and make sure those are properly implemented. That is what you should do. If you talk to a business uh, community alone, there are a lot of exporters. They may have a lot of good ideas. Of course, the government has now appointed this uh, advisory committee, but the advisory committee can't be having just two hour meeting one. No, one, but they came one up with a brilliant idea, yeah. uh, Minister. They wanted to appoint another committee. Yeah. <laughs> so that <laughs> <laughs> probably that's the way it was presented. I don't know. But that has to be a continuous discussion. No? There has to be a, not just one or two hour meetings, long discussions, get ideas find solutions and to pick the best ones and implement. That's yeah. what you must do in the short run. Long term, it is using the right economic Theory. theories and having a proper strategy. Absolutely. Like what we discussed, please go back to Easter's of prosperity. Uh, exactly. Because you promised that to the people, let's, let's trust that document because I don't think there is a problem with that document. I, I, I still don't think there's a problem with the document if we did what was there. Exactly. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Minister, State Minister of Urban Development, uh, Dr. Nalika Gurheva. It has always been a pleasure to talk to you, um, even though during this crisis situation, trying to get us uh, some kind of a response from the government, where the government is blind and not exactly responding properly the way they should be. Um, I hope uh, people take more uh, steps to do that because conversations will heal a lot of wounds uh, that has been inflicted due to the silence of of this government who claim to be people centric so um, you need to do it in action there's uh, the words are not not um, it's useless if there is no action thank you very much for watching that's all the time we have for you tonight i'm mahesh johnny in colombo the news continues right here on Abhiranya 24.